everybody and welcome to our webinar today a classic that brings me actually I love that song in childhood I would dance to it it was amazing so welcome to the webinar plants that will kill you with our guest speaker today Mr. John Murgo and we'll introduce John in just a couple of seconds uh, so thanks for joining us this session is being recorded and so if you need to leave or need to cut out for any reason you can always check it out on the cohorts blog so just to start things off, my name is Allison O'Connor. I'm with CSU Extension in Larimer County. My co-pilot is Amy Lentz with CSU Extension in Weld County. And we just wanna let you know that CSU is an equal opportunity access and non-discrimination university. If there's anything we can do to accommodate your needs, please just let us know and we're happy to do that for you. Like I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and you can find everything we have done for the year. There is quite a bit on there. So as we get through the fall and into the bleak winter months, you can stay entertained with our music and our awesome webinars at csuhorts.blogspot.com. We have two more webinars scheduled for 2023, and these are held on the second Wednesday of each month at noon mountain time. So in November, join Amy and I talking about the garden year in review. And then in December, I'll wrap up the year with fresh new myths, uh, which John actually is covering to some degree today, but I will do not poisonous stuff. And then we will start afresh in 2024 with more webinars for you to join us. And so without further ado, I want to turn it over to our speaker. Mr. John Mergel from Douglas County Extension. He is the horticulture and natural resources specialist, and he is going to dazzle you with everything toxic from this point on. So thanks, John, for joining us, and here we go. Thanks. Uh, all right, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining, joining us here today. Um, so I have, uh, I will start with uh, a disclaimer and that is yes the talk is called plants that will kill plants that will kill you and i'm excited you're here and we are going to talk about some plants that will kill you but we're also going to talk about plants that won't necessarily kill you and by the end of uh, our time today hopefully you will agree with me that um it's complicated and maybe a plant will kill you maybe it won't um, and we'll see what some of the circumstances that lead to that will be so we'll talk about some plants that will kill you some plants that uh, behave badly and some plants that can certainly harm you, even if it doesn't end in your demise. And then um, secondly, um, this is not my day job necessarily, is to talk about poisonous plants. And so if you've got questions about poisonous plants, you know, at the end when you get the question and answer period, you uh, have a question about what particular thing you might uh, want to avoid with one particular plant or a dosage or anything like that, the answer to that question is, I do not know. Um, and I will refer you to a medical doctor, a toxicologist, or something like that. So um, if those are questions that you have, it's going to be a short Q&A session. But hopefully, we'll talk about more general things and some cultural stuff, um, which are really what I appreciate about these plants that will kill you. So uh, what we're going to discuss today, plants that poison. We're going to talk about plants that trick. We're going to talk about plants that were the inspirations for some pretty unpleasant things that we do to one another. And what we're not going to talk about, this other list of things, particularly medical advice. You can see the whole, the whole list of what we won't talk about, including paralysis there at the end. 
Um, but if you are interested in those things, particularly if you're interested in plant lore, which I find uh, certainly interesting, but outside the purview of this, I highly recommend Google Books to you. You can find lots of old books. This one from 1884 is one of my very most favorite. This makes for great fireside reading um, in the wintertime to read about all of the different things associated with plants that could be growing in your garden throughout the year. Uh, second important disclaimer, I am not a doctor and I am not a toxicologist. I'm not a doctor of horticulture. I am certainly not a medical doctor. And so nothing that I tell you today should be construed as medical advice. Um, and if you have questions about the medical ramifications of any of these things, please talk to your doctor. Um, this is a fun and hopefully informative talk, um, but, but certainly not something that could be considered uh, strictly medical in nature. So if that's your expectation, uh, please adjust it now. So otherwise you'll be disappointed. All right, so with that out of the way, uh, plants make poisons and they do other stuff too. The reason they are doing these things is to defend themselves. You know, unlike us or lots of animals that can run away, uh, plants are kind of stuck there. And so some plants certainly try to hide. Think of living stones in South Africa, for example, camouflage like a rock. But for the most part, if you rely on sunlight and you have to be green kind of as a rule, you're going to be noticeable. Um, and so the plant has only a couple options in order to uh, uh, protect itself. And that is to make defensive chemicals that we call secondary metabolites or secondary chemistry. It's called secondary not because it's less important than the primary chemistry of making sugar as a result of photosynthesis, but because it is uh, the second thing that plants do with the energy that they capture from the sun. So they do all of the life-sustaining things and then the secondary metabolites are those chemicals that the plant is making for other purposes, including defense. And then plants also, in addition to those defensive chemicals, have morphological changes that I'm sure uh, we're all familiar with, whether you garden or not. Um, these thorns, hairs, prickles, thick bark, waxy coatings, uh, fuzz like you can see in the thistle here. Um, so lots of ways that these plants defend themselves. As, as an interesting and amusing aside, uh, roses, morphologically speaking, don't have thorns, they have prickles. So the next time somebody tells you every room has its thorn, you can, you can stand up and shout, I object, you're wrong. Um, that is a prickle. Um, if you're interested in the technical difference between those things, uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A section. Um, but every plant on earth is doing this secondary metabolism and many plants have morphological changes for defense. And they're doing this again, they can't run and hide. And so the more I have thought about this throughout my life, it's been sort of a secondary interest. Um, I have come to this conclusion. Every plant out there wants you dead. Plants life that I want that person dead is trying to kill you. It, they just haven't all figured out how to do it yet. So we're going to talk today about some dangerous plants, but just bear in mind, they all want you dead. And every plant is potentially dangerous, depending on the person who's interacting with it. And if you don't believe me, just ask somebody with a peanut allergy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about those defensive measures. First, plant secondary compounds. These are some of the more common categories that people lump these into. Um, all of the uh, chemistries that different groups of plants have developed over time to defend themselves and uh, often used in combination and having arisen in multiple plant lineages multiple times. Um, we're going to talk about plants that do a lot of these things today. Uh, first one, an anticholinergic. It's affecting your neurotransmitters. Um, this is famous in the nightshades uh, and pretty famous also because they cause hallucinations as well as some other unpleasant things. You can see cardiac glycosides. That's famous in things like digitalis, uh, which is the fox glove, which of course is the source of uh, medicine, digoxin, heart medicine, but also can do some pretty unpleasant things to you if uh, taken inappropriately. There are things that cause seizures. Uh, for example, in the ranunculus family, things like monkshood, uh, you have gastrointestinal poisons, famously produced by um, lots and lots of plants, frankly. Um, lots of things try to upset your stomach. Mycosis inhibitors, alkaloids, um, you can see that's a famous one in Nicotiana, um, or the tobacco plant, other members of Solanum, and toxalbumins. Um, those toxalbumins are some of the very most quickly effective poisons. And you'll see that that is the type of poison that the castor bean makes, ricin. 
something that directly attacks your cells rather than having sort of a roundabout way to get you. That one says, nope, turn those cells off, and then it's all over. So there's the poisons list. You can see this, I love this picture because I think we can all get behind the poisoning of the Japanese beetle. You see it still has petal clutched in its in its foil pegs and mandibles as it was eating this petunia, which was producing chemicals toxic to the beetle. All right, so morphological adjustments. There are some obvious things, and then there are some less obvious things. Obvious things um, are things like thorns and prickles or being shaped like a little grove of spears, like these agaves here. If you fall on one of those, you might end up dead, um, at least certainly severely injured. Um, on a smaller scale from spikes like this, you might see irritating hairs. So you can see in this close-up of an echium plant, um, some, some tiny parasitic wasps on there, but also, more importantly, that buzz. And if you look across the top of this petiole in particular, you can see that those things are awfully sharp. And as a person who has gotten them all over my hands before, I can attest to you that, yeah, it's pretty unpleasant and makes me not want to roll around in the echium. And then even smaller than those hairs, but in the same uh, mode of action, would be calcium oxalate crystals. And these are like tiny shards of glass inside uh, the cells of many plants, many house plants, including philodendrons, spathophyllum, and monstera, lots of others, Diffenbachia or dumb cane is famous for it. Um, and these directly damage cells, it's like chewing on a tiny bag of spears, and that creates a huge inflammation response in your body. And so you'll see pictures of people who have um, encountered things like dumb cane, and it's called dumb cane because your mouth will swell up so that you can't speak anymore. So it renders you dumb. Um, again, that's like a combination of physical defense with poisoning. So how are we exposed to plant defenses? Well, it happens all the time because plants turns out are just about everywhere and every single one of them is trying to defend itself. And so unintentionally, you're gonna be exposed to plant defenses when you're hiking, when you're out working in the garden, anything that could bring you into contact, uh, anything you do, that gets you close to plants could get you into con contact with their defensive compounds. So for example, this group of master gardeners preparing some containers for the county fair. Um, they're, look, they've got their, their arms well into these plants. And if those plants are trying to defend themselves, that's an exposure. Does that mean that something bad is going to happen? No, of course not. But it does mean that, yeah, there's those plant defenses at work, potentially. We also have intentional exposures to plant defensive compounds. We have a lot of medicines that are made out of these very things that if taken too much uh, can, can kill you potentially. Um, this is one of my prescription bottles that I got once when I was sick. This is my very favorite label right here. This may cause blurred vision. You say, oh my God, it's already working and I haven't even started. Um, and you can take these things internally and externally. And those toxins, some are only effective if you eat the thing and some are externally effective where they're gonna irritate your skin. Um, and this would include things like allergens and phototoxins. And we expose ourselves to those all the times too, um, intentionally and unintentionally with things like essential oils, lotions, creams, that sort of stuff. It's intentional external exposure to a plant defensive compound. Just because the plant is defending itself doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get some benefit out of it. Again, the right amount can be great medicine. But knowing that we have this wide array of ways in which we can be exposed to plant defensive compounds, I do have three quick ways to consider how to avoid becoming a victim of the defensive compounds of plants. Um, and they're pretty simple. The first one is don't roll around in plants or smother yourself in plant juices. The second one is pay really close attention if you do find yourself in contact with plants or if you find uh, that you're feeling unwell, you've got a rash, well, what was I doing? Pay attention to what plants you might have contacted, because if you need help, it's nice to be able to give a medical provider some information about what potential exposures might have happened. And then the third um, important piece of advice is don't eat plants. Um, very simply put, eating plants is the number one way that you're going to be poisoned by them. So simply by not eating them, you can avoid those exposures. Now, with that having been said, uh, Poisons, uh, particularly plant poisons, work differently on everybody. And usually the health and nutritional status of the individual plays a pretty big part in whether or not the exposure is lethal or even that damaging. And we can all maintain our health by eating vegetables. So I suppose in the end, that salad looks pretty good. We can still eat vegetables. Um, 
But um, all joking aside, there are some really famously poisonous plants. For example, these two cottage garden favorites. Um, on the right, the pink one, you can see foxglove, the digitalis. On the left, you can see monk's hood, aconitum, related to delphinium. These things people know, people know they're poisonous and people uh, are injured or killed from them every single year. There are reports published of somebody who had an accidental exposure to one of these plants or another famously poisonous plant and had some really horrible things happen to them. And uh, it comes down to these two reasons. It's an accidental exposure in a child, unfortunately, he doesn't know better, he's out playing or out on a camping trip and eating things. So if there was ever uh, an inspiration that you needed to spend time with your children outdoors, I hope that this is it, where you can teach them about plants and how not to put things into their mouth. They don't know what they are. And then the second most common way uh, that people are poisoned by these is either accidental or intentional exposures in adults. And these are often associated with alternative medicine. Um, for example, um, from a journal article published now over 40 years ago, you can see that um, this was from uh, an older gentleman who was poisoned by digitalis. Um, and you can see here that uh, for many years, he and his wife practiced alternative medicine successfully. She wasn't feeling well, so he went to collect the leaves. And I just want to draw your attention to this. He himself picked leaves from an unfamiliar plant. He just, I don't know what this is, but then he decided to make a tea with it. And then he drank a cup of that tea, even though it tasted unusually bitter. And I think bitterness is a hallmark of poisonous. Um, and this person, um, I believe he and his wife both survived, but people do die from this sort of thing. And you can see, like, okay, where were the places that, where were the choices that could have been made differently here? And taking leaves from an unfamiliar plant is one of those choices that I think we can all agree would be not a great thing to then decide to make a tea and drink. Um, digitalis, is very poisonous, but it's not as poisonous as aconitum. You only need three to six milligrams of the active ingredients of aconitum to kill you. And so let me relate this story to you of a 25-year-old otherwise healthy man who died suddenly following an outing with his friends where he decided to eat a number of wild berries and plants, including this one. So there is essentially, essentially an intentional accidental exposure in an adult to a poisonous plant. So my advice does truly stand, don't eat plants, particularly if you don't know what it is. Uh, make sure that you know what you're exposing your body to. Um, we are part of the system of the world and things work. I mean, alternative medicine works because plants have active compounds for us. So if you don't know what it is, you might end up next. Don't eat plants. Good advice, I think. All right, so with that out of the way, let's talk a bit now about some individual plants that are also dangerous and then have some cultural relevance. Um, they're things that you're going to see in the news or hear about in stories. So I think they're fun to talk about. We're going to start with poisoners. And the first poisoner is one of the most famous that you'll see uh, is, of course, deadly nightshade. And deadly nightshade um, could be referring to a number of different plants, but one of the very most usually that it refers to, it being you know, deadly nightshade being a common name, is Atropa belladonna. Um, this is the plant that we get atropine from, which is a heart medication. Uh, belladonna, of course, meaning beautiful woman, because one of the symptoms of poisoning with this plant is dilation of the eyes. Uh, dilation of the eyes. Checking your nose makes everyone more beautiful if your eyes are dilated. Um, and Atropa, the genus name, actually comes from uh, the god of death. And so you see in this poem, someone complaining about breaking up with his girlfriend, wrote, I hate this loathsome life, O oh, Atropos, draw nigh. And so uh, he said, well, what's a plant that can usher somebody to death? How about this one, Tropa belladonna? You also see nightshades like this one, black nightshade. Um, it's a common weed around here that you'll find where eating the plants uh, themselves could be problematic, although the berries themselves, similar to tomatoes, no problem. You'll see that this has been a medicinal plant for a number of years. Uh, this 1826 tree piece, for example, is on the use of a Tropa belladonna. And it's unfortunately suppressed botanic name, which is my favorite plant name, at least of the week, Selenum Leaf Valley. That is a good botanic name. Um, nightshades, it's a big family, also have some cultural relevance. Um, you might have heard of the cannibal's tomato, which is a type of uh, Solanum that's grown in the Southeast Indies. 
that according to explorers was the kind of tomato that you used to promote the digestibility of human flesh. I'm not sure how people knew that, um, but if you really wanted to, you could still buy seeds for this and grow it. A couple bucks for a pack of seeds, there it is. Um, yeah, so go for that. It could be your next Halloween display. But in terms of poisoning, one of the most famous in the United States is the Jimson weed or the Datura, also known as the thorn apple because its fruit is this horrible spiny bomb right here that's open. You can see it's dropping out of seeds. And Jimson weed is a, um, a shortening or a, a slang of Jamestown weed. And it's named this common name in English because there's this famous poisoning event of some soldiers who were there shortly after the United States uh, was colonized by the English. And you can see here that some people ate some plants that they didn't know what they were. So again, don't eat plants. Um, and they ate plentifully of it. And you can see here, the effect was real funny. Um, they went absolutely nuts and they climbed some trees and um, it took 11 days for them to return to normal. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's some time away from work for sure. And this gets even more horrifying, recognizing that people will use this intentionally on one another. So there's this famous case of zombies and real zombies. This was published uh, back in the 80s in Harvard Magazine using Datura stramonium, which is a common Jimson weed. And when combined with the paralyzing toxin of the pufferfish, you can create the sensation that a person is dead. So the pufferfish toxin paralyzes them so completely that, you know, they're dead. They might get buried, for example. And then the mental confusion comes from the plant. And so with just the pufferfish, all you have is a poisoning victim. But with the plant, you have not only a person whom everyone believes to be dead, but then also um, a person with those anticholinergic poisoning symptoms, which includes those vivid hallucinations um, and loss of memory, as well as some other unpleasant things. And so, you know, as I was preparing for this, it occurred to me, you know, here's a brugnansia. This is this is related to Datura. This is also known as an angel's trumpet. This contains all those same toxins as the Datura does. And I had always thought growing up, I'm like, oh, it's an angel's trumpet because look at these flowers, right? They're big and long and they smell and they smell wonderful and they're so pretty. It must be the case that that's why they're called angel's trumpet. And I've decided, I've revised my opinion about that common name. And upon some reflection, angel's trumpets don't announce pleasant experiences. They're announcing the end of the world, which um, culturally speaking, um, usually means a vision of hell is involved. And so I think that these are called angels' trumpets, not because of their uh, appearance, but because of the horrifying hallucinations that people are prone to when they experiment with this plant. Again, they're eating plants. Don't do that. Um, this book, uh, Poisonous Plants, one of my favorites, it's a, it's a bibliographic reference of plant poisonings. And the two authors uh, in the section about Jimson Weed's Datura Brugnansia remark that the readiness with which people in all parts of the world experiment toxicologically on themselves is alarming. And I think, yeah, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Can't be said better. Um, when uh, this uh, is consumed, you get all of those anticholinergic effects. And so um, this one patient, for example, was described as bone dry, stone blind, mad as a hen, and hot as a volcano. Essentially, that's because it's suppressing those nervous system, the sort of automatic nervous system functions. So you stop making pee, it slows down your digestive tract, it dilates your eyes, you can't see a thing. Um, so again, discussing this uh, with my wife, the yeah, nurse reminded me that, oh yeah, we have this candy mnemonic to learn about this. It rhymes. And if you're poisoned by something like this, so you um, can't see, can't pee, can't spit, can't defecate. Um, and that sums up what happens here, along with terrifying hallucinations. And so people describe things, for example, of being pursued by waist high spiders. Um, someone was being pursued by a giant cherry that wanted to eat them. There was a child who accidentally ingested some of this, who thought that his mom was a monster with serpents for arms, and that an overcoat was his mother. And you have people often because of this 
flush heat that you get um, and being thirsty, the bone dry effects. Um, oftentimes, if you're poisoned by this, you take off your clothes and head for open water. And so you end up with a lot of hypothermia and drowning associated with these plants. So again, angels trumpets, not announcing nice visions, not announcing nice things, don't do that. Famously, within the nightshade family are two of our most popular food crops, potatoes and tomatoes. So let's talk about them. Can they kill you? The answer is, well, probably, depends on who you are, maybe. So potatoes contain a compound called solanine, right there after the genus name, and it needs to be ingested in a high enough quantity to hurt you. So luckily, your body is used to living with plants, and so you can actually process some of these chemicals. And in fact, solanine is in these potatoes that you see here, and you can deal with a small enough amount of it. It's only when you eat a high enough amount that you get the poisoning symptoms. Um, there's a lot of reports of green potatoes making people sick, but unfortunately, it's really hard to diagnose exactly what's happening. So they might be exaggerated thanks to things like foodborne illness. And importantly, despite what the internet says, solanine cannot form a gas and kill you. So there's this famous story, among others, but I think it's a recent story, just maybe 15 years ago, about an entire family that was killed in Russia because of solanine gas that was in their potato cellar from rotting potatoes. Well, number one, rotting potatoes don't suddenly make more solanine. The solanine is in the living potatoes because that's how they're defending themselves. And as a compound, its melting point is over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not something that's going to spontaneously form a gas. I did some digging, though, and you can abbreviate solanine with solanine GAs, um, abbreviating glycoalkaloids. And if you're not real careful, that clearly says solanine gas. And then you get a rumor started. And so I would uh, just encourage everyone here, in addition to not eating plants, um, to be very careful when you are reading and researching. Make sure you've done your homework and think critically about things that you read, especially things on the internet, um, but all over the place. Make sure, make sure you've got your thinking cap on. And don't All right, tomatoes. Tomatoes contain something called tomatine. And I hope you've realized by now as well that um, the people that name plants and chemicals are really, really creative. And this chemical is in the leaves and the stems and the unripe fruits. And then the concentration goes down as the fruits ripen, because of course the tomato wants the fruit to be eaten so that its seeds get distributed away. And this is active against some insects and some fungus. Uh, obviously not against this particular insect, this also, this compound is active against things like fusarium, although you're in a constant arms race with the plant and the fungus in order to um, win, you know. And for humans, tomatine seems to be much less effective than solanine as a defensive compound. And so you'd have to eat something like a pound of tomato leaves to have unpleasant effects from this, and the unpleasant effects are probably just gonna be gastric. But you might have met people that ate too many fried green tomatoes, right? And that um, that stomach unpleasantness involved with that could well be the result of something like tomatine. It's also, though, heavily uh, investigated as having potential health benefits, including some anti-cancer properties when targeted to those cancer cells. So it's not like you could cure cancer by eating your tomato plant. But this is another example of where a defensive compound, um, we can harness the activity of that defensive compound to improve human health. All right, next up, terrifying lavender. Um, and this one won't kill you, but I think it's a great example and I included it because um, it's one to show, you know, oh yeah, lavender helps you sleep and we use its essential oil for various purposes. And yes, and yes, those things work. And they work because they're active on our physiology and they can do some unintended things. And so there are some very famous uh, cases at this point of lavender containing uh, essential oils and lotions that actually for uh, prepubescent children functioned as phytoestrogens and disrupted their end endocrine system and promoted breast growth on children, including young boys, um, that stopped once the lavender was no longer applied. And so that's, that's um, a dramatic effect that even external application of a plant and a plant essential oil can have. So um, again, don't douse yourself in plant juices, don't eat plants, um, are yes, tongue-in-cheek advice, but very true in recognizing that just because it's from a plant doesn't mean it's harmless, um, and that, yeah, it interacts with your body, for sure, and that's why you should know what you're getting into 
before you start using um, the plant for some reason, because they do actually work, but that means they actually work. So you should be careful. All right. So we're going to get ready now, Allison, with the poll. Um, so we're going to talk about another functional plant, opium poppies. So opium poppies have been recognized as a medicinal plant for at least 3,000 years. They make over 170 compounds that are poisonous, including the ones that can be turned into morphine. And if you ever watched, certainly Seinfeld, but I'm sure other shows as well, or heard urban legends, that you can eat a bagel with poppy seeds in it and fail your drug test. So I'm going to ask everybody now, can you fail a drug test by eating bagels? Ooh, this is good. I like it. Very much people think no. Sweet. All right, a couple more seconds. Three, two, one. Great. Oops. Did I share results? Sorry, Allison, I think I tried to just remove All right, so most people say no. Great. Uh, the answer is that uh, it depends. It would be a lot, a lot of eggs. Um, turns out that poppy seeds are the part of the plant that contains the least amount of the alkaloids, 0.005% uh, by weight. So you would need to eat about half a jar of poppy seeds before you would show up on a drug test. That's, mind you, not toxicological effect. That's not making you sick. That's just being detected on a drug test. So can you fail a drug test by eating bagels? Probably not, unless you are eating an awful lot of bagels or just eating half a jar of seeds. All right, next up, cyanide. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard that uh, certain plants produce cyanide, famously peach pits, apricots, almonds, all of those are true. And um, which plants produce cyanide? Lots of them. Um, grasses can do it, um, things like sorghum, hydrangeas that you see here, and then many, many members of the rose family produce cyanide. Um, in parts of their bodies. They would say, well, not really cyanide immediately. So let's talk about that. Because cyanide will kill anything. Cyanide kills anything alive. It disrupts uh, respiration, the electron transport chain. It's taking energy from triggers. Cyanide shuts that down. And so you quickly run out of energy in your cells and you have a total blackout of cell energy, which means you are dead. So how does the plant avoid if the plant can't have cyanide in it? How does the plant generate cyanide and not die itself. And the answer to that is it keeps two components in separate places that only when mixed together, say when somebody comes along and chews them, generate cyanide via a chemical reaction. And so by separating the compounds within the body of the plant, and different plants do this with different, uh, different cells and different ways around it, then the cyanide is only generated when the plant tissue is destroyed usually by chewing, but you can also get um, dramatic effects if, if uh, freezing, for example, happens, certain grasses are famous for becoming poisonous and not usable as fodder once they're frozen because you get such an uptick in poisonous compounds like cyanide. And so Snow White's poison apple could be a real thing because apple seeds do indeed contain those cyanogenic glycosides that when encountering the digestion process, mix together and generate cyanide gas. However, very similar to the poppy seeds, you would need to eat a lot of apple seeds before you would have the negative consequences of generating that cyanide. Again, your body is able to process a certain amount of those glycosides to make sure that you don't drop dead anytime you take a nibble of any. There is one case of poisoning that's been reported from apple seeds. It was for someone who chewed and swallowed an entire cup of apple seeds, which gives them a small size. The apple seeds, you see, uh, puts you in the puts you in the problematic range for cyanide generation. So apples and cyanide in the apple seeds, perhaps not a huge concern. Beans, on the other hand, um, are really frightening, frankly. Uh, dry beans, including the dry beans that we just eat every day without thinking another thing about it, contain lectins. You might have heard of these before as an anti-nutrient. Um, they're popular, they're, um, they bind to the intestinal wall and they make sure that you can't get nutrition out of your food. 
Um, this works so well that for a while, people have made things like uh, intestinal tonics and weight loss pills out of bean lectins, these proteins that attack your cells um, to make you less able to absorb nutrition. Depending on the type of bean, the amount that's in a bean uh, varies. Kidney beans tend to be the worst. And thankfully, lectins are denatured by high temperatures. So they're um, by cooking the beans, you are able to completely destroy those toxins and then no problem. So make sure that uh, according to the FDA, for example, the beans are above 212 degrees for at least 30 minutes for these dry beans to destroy those toxins. Which means, number one, don't use your slow cooker uh, to cook those beans unless you're sure it's getting above 212 degrees Fahrenheit and not all of them do. And then lastly, don't eat dry, raw, dry beans raw. And you think, well, that seems really unpleasant. Why would I ever do that? Um, it would be like putting a rock in your mouth and trying to chew it up. And you would be right about that. But um, as raw food diets increase in popularity, we do have um, suggestions of things like, let's uh, put these beans into a blender after we've soaked them in water, and then we'll have a raw bean paste to eat. And that sort of thing could be harmful to you, um, again, depending on the type of bean that is in there. I think there was a poisoning case reported of some people that got tired of waiting for the beans to be finished cooking, and they just put them into a blender and pulverized them before those lectins were fully destroyed, and it did not end super well. And in general, beans are some of the more frightening plants that we commonly encounter and think of as, yeah, totally harmless, no problem, um, that are actually real problems. I will point out though, the castor beans are not among them because castor beans are not real beans. They're members of the Euphorbia family related to poinsettias, for example. But many true legumes, true beans are also very poisonous, including the loco weeds, for example, famous Colorado, Aptesia, Laburnum. And they have not just one, but several toxic compounds like we talked about in that first list right here. Um, laburnum, uh, the golden chain tree, it's just beautiful. There are very few plants that you could do this sort of thing with the arch golden dangling branches. Um, and it, it's very poisonous. And again, so it's something that's out in the garden that you want to make sure that you knew of, and that visitors knew of. Um, one good thing about many poisonous plants, because they're using a suite of defensive compounds, number one, they taste terribly, mostly. Um, but then secondarily, there are actually few reports of lethal exposures to laburnum, even though the chemicals that it contains are quite, quite toxic and should be able to kill you. And the reason for that is because usually um, when you're exposed to those things orally, you are vomiting so vigorously and so quickly that your exposure to the comp compounds is significantly reduced. So that's one way that the toxic plant is really helping you out um, by just giving you a really unpleasant digestive experience, reducing that vomiting, and then you're less exposed to the poisons. I, however, would not rely on that as a way to sort of like, I can never be poisoned by plants, I'll just have to throw up. Uh, number one, that sounds horrible. And number two, probably not reliable. So again, don't eat plants. So uh, we've been through again, uh, several, several plants and I've saved now um, in terms of poisoning at least, the absolute most terrifying one, salary. Goodness gracious. Um, and this is one that's not gonna poison you if you eat it. It's not like that, but it's it's really one of the most um, most horrifying, in my opinion, because it's it's uh, such sort of a sneaky thing. And I've always thought celery is sort of so innocuous and, and yet not. And celery, along with some members of that family um, and lemons and limes, both weeds and food crops, are famous for inducing phytophotodermatitis which is essentially a plant-induced sunburn. And when you have some of the compounds that these plants make, uh, thoracoumarins, you mix that with sunlight, you get sunburn on steroids. So a warning, I'm about to show you um, a gross image. So if you don't like to see gross images, close your eyes and look away. Here it comes. Three, two, one. This is somebody's hand after working with celery. Uh, leaving the juice on their hands. So again, could have washed your hands, it would have been a good idea. And then after sun exposure. So you can see four days after that, horrible sunburn, huge horrible blisters, a week later, and then 10 days later, still dealing with the ramifications of that. From celery juice. So again, in addition to not eating plants, it's important not to roll around in plant juices without being really sure you know what you're signing yourself up for. All right. And uh, this guy is just infamous, right? The poinsettia. 
I'm sure that many folks have heard that poinsettias are poisonous, very dangerous, particularly to animals. Um, and I will tell you that there were almost 23,000 cases of poinsettia poisoning evaluated by the Pittsburgh Poison Center. And just a note about that, that's if somebody calls and reports an exposure, that's how the Poison Control Center will report that exposure. So out of 23,000 um, cases, and this was a study done um, in 1996, so it's a bit old, we've known about this a while. Um, out of 23,000 cases, more than 21,000 of them had no reaction whatsoever um, to exposure to eating that poinsettia. And the remaining cases uh, had mild stomach upset. So um, this plant may actually be far less concerning than, um, than it has a reputation for. Um, in 1978, actually, the National Clearinghouse for Poison Control Centers in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, registered 228 cases involving poinsettia. And of those 228, 14 of them had symptoms of any kind. And those symptoms consisted of feeling unwell. And so um, while I would still advise you not to eat a poinsettia, um, this is not the most toxic plant you have in your house. And in fact, much safer than beans, frankly. All right, so that's enough about poisoning. Now I wanna talk about some less than savory behaviors that plants engage in. And thankfully for us, um, some of this is going to be about targeting other organisms, namely insects. So we all know about Venus flytraps. We won't talk more about that. I want to talk about milkweeds, which is the darling plant of, of the day right now, right? Because we're all uh, big fans of monarch butterflies. And milkweeds are really cool plants because they offer nectar rewards but they're really direct about pollen transfer. They don't want uh, to just dust pollen onto an insect and then hope that it falls into the right place on the next flower. They actually make these leg traps and then clamp their pollen onto a pollinator leg. So you can see here, um, you've got this little slit and all it takes is the insect to step in the right spot. The leg goes through the, the little trap and gets the pollinium. You see this uh, sort of banana shaped orange thing clamped onto the pollinator's leg. This is a close-up of that trap there. And honeybees are not consistently strong enough to get out of those leg traps. And so if you look carefully, the next time you see your uh, planting of milkweeds, you might see some really horrifying scenes of dead and dismembered honeybees that got trapped in these milkweeds as those pollinia were planted. You can get uh, pollinia plants one after another in these long chains called concatenation. It's a the chain, fun word though. Um, so here you can see a honeybee's leg attached. Here's a honeybee dangling death from its foot. Here's another foot just hanging on this flower. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't plant milkweed. You should. And it's true, honeybees are non-native species and whatever. But this is still pretty grisly to come across out there in the flower garden. Um, some other famous deceptive things that plants do in terms of pollination is, of course, um, offer uh, nectar rewards. Um, or not. And so in the case of, of this plant, for example, um, which is related to the corpse flower, uh, this is Rotunculus vulgaris, which is um, dead horse flower, or who knows, any number of common names. Um, it looks like, as you can see, a dead thing, and it smells like a dead thing. And so this is one, if you grow, if you grow in your garden, put it far away from the kitchen window, um, we would grow these plants uh, at the zoo, and I would plant them by the monkeys so that I could blame the monkeys for the smell, because um, it really is um, impressive. Okay, uh, I want to finish off today talking about some plants, again, that inspired some pretty horrible things in terms of human inventions. And uh, the, the biggest one that I want to talk about is the Caltrop, uh, C-A-L-T-R-O-P, that uh, has also been around a long time, but was first used, at least in recorded history, by this gentleman right here, um, who even in this line drawing you might recognize is Alan, Alexander the Great. And uh, Alexander the Great, in 300 BC or so, when he was conquering the Persian Empire, uh, came up with this great idea based on this plant seed. So if you have ever had a flat bag, uh, bike tire, um, or uh, found yourself suddenly wearing tap shoes while on a hike, you may have run in across this goat head uh, that grows around here. And these fruits, there are four seeds attached here, 
each of them has their spikes on it, so that no matter which way this is distributed off of the plant and lands, one of those spikes will be pointing directly upwards. And we said, hey, that's a great idea. And so you can make these out of metal. You can still buy them. They're still used to puncture tires. So you can just throw them, and no matter what, you've got a spike pointing straight up. So again, Alexander the Great used them. There are stories um, of the Byzantines using them, uh, attached with grenades of Greek fire, so you could throw an explosive and then it spread these all over the place. Um, just like what happens with this plant when it distributes its seeds. And so more than just poisoning, I mean, it's a great demonstration. Yes, we can get medicine out of these plants, but um, similar to the way that uh, our willingness to chemically experiment on ourselves is alarming. I would say so is our ability to see everything and turn it immediately into something to hurt somebody else with. Too bad. Um, so I'd like to finish on that depressing note with a more amusing example. And so this is the sporting cucumber. And this again has been known and cultivated for at least 3,000 years. This plant is carved into the wall of the temple of Karnak. Um, it's been used medicinally for a long time. It was poisoning if you eat too much of it, um, like so many of them, the wheat plants. And so, yes, can inspiration be truly known um, if we've had such a long relationship with this plant saying, well, yeah, that definitely inspired X, Y, or Z? I will let you decide that for yourself. So here it is. This is uh, X volume elotarium. See what it does here. Yeah. So this plant, I, I swear, this plant is the inspiration for rocket ships. Um, what it does is it actually pressurizes its fruit with water as it ripens so that um, when the seeds are ready to be disturbed, it just takes uh, a touch of a raindrop or a person passing by or me with my finger to uh, set that explosive off. And you saw those seeds being rocketed all over the place um, with that slow motion sound of, of a shotgun. Kick it hey John, so, you gotta show it again. You gotta show it again. All right, I'll show it again. I'll let me share it again. <laughs> yes, if I'm ever feeling if I'm ever feeling blue, I just uh, I just pull up that video because <laughs> it's so amazing. All right, let's see here. Here we go. Maybe. <laughs> it doesn't get better oh my goodness yeah so that's something that's you amazing you just stand out in the yard um stand out in the yard and watch the x volume explode so um i hope hopefully that was that was fun and in time for halloween hopefully you have a story to tell your halloween party um but remember if you need medical advice you should you should definitely call your that was the coolest thing. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the, the Q&A, if you don't mind answering them. Uh, so the first is from Barbara, and she asks, does soy also contain phytoestrogens? And if so, does it have the similar effects as lavender? And I don't know if you would be able to answer that or not. You know, I have heard that it does. Um, I would say we probably don't do much soy application externally, but the short answer is I don't know. And that's that's a great question. Um, that's a great question for a doctor or a toxic. Uh, does Asclepius tuberosa have the same trapping? Yes, all the Asclepius do that. And so um, Asclepius tuberosa is small enough that I don't think that it can um, that it can trap the bee because it's just the smallest flowers more easily to overcome that uh, the trap. I see honeybees hanging dead all the time from the swamp milkweed and the showy milkweed, particular uh, sleepiest species. Uh, what is the creepy creature in my background? It is a jumping spider, gold jumper thing that caught fly. And yes, Robert, it will be recorded in this. And there was a question that came in about how milkweed kills bees and if it has carnivorous activity and I read it as it's just super sticky and they get stuck, basically. Yeah, it's it's not intentionally doing it. It's just that uh, milkweed didn't have honeybees as a pollinator. And so honeybees can do it, but they need for because for the milkweed, that's a that's a pollination fail. Like if you're if your mailman is hanging dead from your mailbox, 
something went wrong. And so the, the plant doesn't want the bee to be dead. It happens by accident. Okay, John, one last one here. Um, do you know the difference between nightshade and wonderberries? We, uh, we get this a lot. So differently. Um, there, are, uh, there are two common names. And so without knowing for sure what, what particular plant that refers to, I, I would hesitate to answer that question. So I do know shades some shades in general are okay. in Solanaceae family, and it's possible that wonderberries. I mean, that's that certainly sounds like a superfood and could definitely be something in the nightshade family. But without 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 pinpointing exactly what plants those are. Good answer. Thanks. Yep. I see your don't eat, don't eat the you, plants. You can call your horticulture specialist. <laughs> And remember, don't eat plants. Um, yeah, I mean, just in case in point, this sort of thing happens all the time. Um, just here in here in our extension office recently, I had some folks come in with a plant that was growing in one of their hanging baskets. And they said, well, what is this? We think it's basil and we're going to eat it. <laughs> uh, this is like, uh, this is topical because this is the number one way that poisoning exposures happen is people decide to eat plants um that they don't know what they are and so that's in this case it was oh no we just lost the we know it's this we just lost the seed packet and we're hoping you can help with variety but um yeah don't eat don't eat plants um, don't eat plants um just a lot of positive comments john thank you this was so perfect for our season that we're in here in october yeah, um i did put I did put into the chat that you can join us next month for a gardening year in review. Amy and I will teach that. And it was a weird year. So if you want to hear more weird stuff, join us in November. Uh, but with that, thank you, John. Always entertaining. Please send me that video so I can giggle whenever I'm having a tough day. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month. Thanks.